Good evening and welcome to the October 2024 Elizabethtown Area School District Board Workshop Session. Tonight's meeting is presided over by Mr. Stephen Lindemuth, Board President. For in-person attendees, if you wish to address the board during public comment portion of the meeting, please complete district official yellow card in full and place it in the drop box conveniently located in the front of the auditorium by 7 p.m. The public comment session concludes early. It will be adjourned at that time. For our virtual audience, please note this is a view only session. As a reminder, tonight's meeting is being recorded and will be available for viewing on the district's YouTube channel for one year. Thank you for your interest in the Elizabethtown Area School District. At this time, I'll turn the meeting over to Ms. Vendemuth to begin. All right, thank you, Mr. Portzer. We'd like to welcome everybody here tonight. Draw this meeting, uh, workshop meeting, uh, committee the whole meeting together. Uh, we'd like to welcome you and just um, thank you for coming out on a beautiful fall evening. So, um, before we get started, um, well, let's do, let's do, let's stand for the pledge and have a moment of silence. So keep in mind uh, the hurricane victims in North Carolina and also um, just pray for mercy. I would pray for mercy for the people of Florida. Uh, pray that hurricane falls apart. Keep that in mind as we, as we stand. Pledge of Allegiance to the, to the flag. flag. United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, so I just felt it was better to do the pledge in the moment of silence to get us started. Uh, going backtracking here a little bit uh, from the welcome, we do have a certificate here, uh, a certificate of appreciation that has come in uh, from PSBA. It's a five-year certificate of appreciation to Mendel Riggleman. Uh, so that is, of course, uh, combining his previous term here as well as another year on board. So we would like to, uh, I would like to present this to Menno in, in appreciation for his five years of serving on the board as it relates to uh, PSBA, the PSBI honor roll here. So Mr. Rickman, congratulations. All right, we are ready uh, for our roll call vote, Mrs. Maxwell. Mrs. Carter? Here. Mr. Emery? Present. Mr. Gillis? Here. Mrs. Lindemuth? Here. Mr. Reed? Here. Mr. Riegelman? Here. Mrs. Schrum? Here. Wilson? Here. Mr. Lindemuth. Here. You had a chance to look at uh, the last couple of days here to look at the agenda. Uh, hopefully every, everything looks in order there. Do we have a motion to approve tonight's agenda? So moved. All right, we have a motion and a second. Are there any questions about the agenda? All right, uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, agenda is approved. Superintendent's announcements, Dr. Nell. Thank you and good evening, everyone. Um, Elizabethtown Area High School recently concluded its Instant Decision Week 2024. 
Throughout the week, our high school seniors had the unique opportunity to engage with college representatives and receive immediate admissions decisions, streamlining the college application process. The event welcomed representatives from 20 colleges and three military branches, resulting in a total of 124 appointments, a significant 28% increase in participation compared to last year. The acceptance rate for students who applied soared to 97%, up from the 90% we had last year. We take pride in being one of the few high schools in Pennsylvania to host such an impactful event, demonstrating our commitment to enhancing our students' education and career pathways. Be sure to mark your calendars for three other exciting upcoming events. Our high school fall play, Arsenic and Old Lace, will be performed on Thursday, November 7th and Saturday, November 9th. Additionally, the high school orchestra's Pops concert is set for Thursday, November 14th. We will also honor our veterans at the Veterans Day Commemoration Ceremony on November 11th at 10.15 a.m. And we do welcome all veterans in the community um, to join us. So if you are aware of any, please have them look at our website for more information. One of our core pillars for success is our community connections. And this evening, I would like to express my gratitude to a few groups in particular. The East High Elementary School PTO and the Bear Creek School PTO uh, had a successful fundraising event this past weekend. On Friday, the East High PTO hosted a fun run at Jane Hoover Field, and so far they have raised $9,800, and they are still collecting donations if you're interested. These funds will support a variety of initiatives, including their leadership t-shirts for students and staff, family events, book fairs, teacher appreciation activities, the beloved Jingle Bear Shop, and much more. And you can find donation information on our website. Then, Saturday, our Bear Creek PTO enjoyed beautiful weather for their second annual carnival. The event featured games, prizes, bounce houses, slides, a raffle, delicious treats from the concession stand, and the ever popular dunk tank. While the totals are still being calculated, all of the proceeds will benefit the PTO who will use it to support our students. So thank you to everyone involved in making those events successful. And a heartfelt thank you goes out to many parents who stopped by the fun run um, to cheer on their children and also those who enjoyed the carnival. Your presence and support as families and parents in our community are invaluable to our success. And they help meet that community connection pillar that we are striving towards and we appreciate it. Those conclude my announcements for this evening. All right, thank you, Dr. Now, we have uh, our new student reps here the last month or two here, so we are ready to hear from them, have their reports. Uh, we'll turn the turn it over to Emma and uh, Monica. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. As we move into the holiday season, as well as begin our discussions on the financial necessities of a new school facility, I'm sure we'll also begin to see ways in which spending can be cut back and how we can begin budgeting. In previous years, some people have lobbied to decrease and defund our theater and music programs. These programs are essential to the education of our student body. Around 170 students in our high school participate in at least one of our three music ensembles, and over 100 students participate each year in our high school theater production. As we progress into the winter months, I encourage our board and also our community members to reevaluate the importance of the arts at our school, but also to go out and support our students. Our fall play, Arsenic and the Old Lace, is a witty dark company dark comedy that will premiere November 7th at 7 p.m. and November 9th at 1 and 7 p.m. Our orchestra pops concert will be held on November 14th. Three of our schools will hold concerts, which include each of the three ensembles, Bear Creeks on December 5th, the middle schools on December 16th, and the high school's concert on December 9th. Please keep in mind how students benefit from these valuable learning experiences. Thank you. Uh, hello all. Uh, recently, some of our high school seniors participated in Instant Decision Week. Um, you've already heard about this, so I'll keep it short. But um, with a 98% acceptance rate, it's a very valuable um, tool for our high school seniors. Um, this week is also our mini Thon Spirit Week, where students are encouraged to dress up and donate um, for a with cancer. 
Um, to go along with this, our gold out game is this Friday where students and of course the public are encouraged to wear gold in support of childhood cancer. Our volleyball team also held their dick pink football game where each event raises funds that directly support the cancer research program and spread word of their mission to the people in the community who could use the support. Uh, that is all. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you, ladies, for the uh, informative announcements there. Appreciate that. It's good to hear from you. Uh, at this time, I believe we're ready to start our committee meetings. Um, try to do our best to give fair time to each of the committees here tonight. Uh, we have some heavy things to discuss on facilities and finance, a little lighter on some of the other issues. But uh, with that being said, we'll turn it over to our facilities chair for a couple of items to discuss there. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, so I know uh, a lot of the community, uh, as well as the faculty and staff, has been long awaiting um, to hear back in terms of this uh, inclusive playground at Bear Creek. And so I've, I've uh, uh, comprised some things to, uh, to showcase tonight. And with that, I'd like to call on uh, Jim France, our Director of Operations, to come up and give us a presentation to like. Oh, just uh, before you guys start, sorry, but the tech tech department back there, we're having a little trouble with board docs up here. Is anyone else having trouble with it? Yeah, I am too. We, we seem to have lost our board docs. Okay. Hello, hello. Okay. We do have it on the screen here up so we can see, at least see it there for okay. now. Uh, thank you for letting me present today our three playground options for phase three of our inclusive playground at Bear Creek. Um, all the options are available to be installed by summer 2025. All the vendors, our companies, our co-stars approved. So we're, we're, we would be good to go uh, moving forward with all that. And um, as you look at the images that I provide tonight, keep in mind, we'll be able to capture the colors we currently have there on these renderings so everything should look seamless uh, from what we currently have available. So option one was uh, through a company called General Recreation out of Newton Square, PA. They are the company that originally installed a playground at Bear Creek when it was first put into play. That equipment has held up fantastic for the last 12 years or so. Uh, it's in great condition yet, uh, despite the hard use that it gets. Uh, this design is four play structures plus two additional shade structures, uh, totaling $129,650.50 with the install, with the pour and play surfacing that we required in the footprint we were looking at. Um, if you're able to scan through the photos on the following pages, you can see this, this version is really for our inclusive students, uh, our special needs students, trying to get them involved and give them the opportunity to work with and play with uh, all the other students at Bear Creek. Uh, there's some images that show uh, bollards there. Those are bollards are actually where we have our phase one equipment already placed. Um, you can sh see the shade structures. Um, there were some questions and concerns. The, the one item, it's a kind of a spin merry-go-round uh, that we call it the uh, Omnispin spinner. And just a little bit of liability question with that, whether um, if we're picking up special needs students from a wheelchair and placing them into that, I'm not sure where we stand liability-wise. So I would have to look into that one a little bit more. This option um, gives us uh, some flexibility. It is the cheapest of the three options. We could remove the dome, we could remove a shade structure, and possibly put some more equipment in there for the students to, to help grow it uh, to compare with some of the other quotes. Uh, 
room four. Option two is with a company called MRC Recreation. They're out of Mechanicsburg, PA. And this is a custom Powerscape inclusive unit that actually also has two small additional pieces with it. Now, this is our most expensive. Uh, the total of cost for this came out to $155,000. This is quite a large structure, a lot provided in a small footprint. Um, we were able, after conversing with them, uh, Game Time is the manufacturer of uh, the product, and MRC, they both donated funds back um, by, you know, heated and baked, I guess you'd say. Uh, because this was at the top, and they were able to discount this unit sixty-seven thousand dollars and six hundred fifty-three. Well, sixty-seven thousand six hundred fifty-three dollars to bring us down to that one hundred fifty-five thousand. And as you can see by the following images, uh, again we would get the coloring to match what's currently there. There's quite a bit going on as you look at this. Um, we've got ramps for weird wheelchair accessibility. We've got multiple slides that are ADA compliant, as well as uh, free flowing for other students. We have some seated areas, uh, swing areas. We have a, a small little uh, parallel bar kind of thing and uh, some steps, uh, along with two standalone swings uh, that are, they're not swings per se, it's a, a whirlwind seat and a sentry wave seat, which uh, we could possibly add some things in that ramp area and possibly put a couple more of those seats in to, to add some more inclusion to this piece. Um, this is option two, as, and again, you can see the discount is great. Um, and total is still, though, at the high end of our spectrum, what we were looking at. Option three is George Ely's. Now, this is the company that provided us our phase one equipment. Um, they did a great job with that, and this will be an elevated play area with multiple stations. Um, they also gave us a discount as well. The total here comes to $146,100 with a discount of $5,715. And if you look at the following images, um, it's not a sparse unit. There's not as much going on as in option two, but um, this aero glider looks like a fantastic piece that uh, would provide two wheelchairs fully capable of getting in, turning around, and, and city, seating, and then being able to be inclusive with other students, whether they be special needs or any student within Bear Creek, as well as any um, social workers, paras, and teachers that might be on site. Uh, there's also a special slide there that has a little bit of a landing pad off to the side, if you can see that, that would provide extra seating for someone. So um, again, these images are as close as we can get. This could also be some renderings changed to, in the future, bring even more pieces of equipment into this. You can see there's plenty of room for additions. Um, and you'll see the price there again. So option one. Cost is 129650 It would allow for possible expansion and flexibility. It's currently four pieces and two straight shade structures. But I think as we would do any give and take, we could possibly alter those plans to be a bit more efficient to what we're looking for in, in our long-term goals. Option two, the cost is 155000 That is the top end of what we were looking at. This option does provide us the most play surfacing and, and equipment for our students, and then option three is the 146,100. Again, a rebate given there as well, too, and two very specific inclusive pieces involved with that as well. Any questions for me regarding this? So, Jim, before we go to any questions, I would like to thank you um, for your diligence on this, uh, for your homework. Um, thank you for um, uh, squeezing the nickel. Uh, being being frugal on it, um, I will remind the board that uh, this this inclusive playground at 155 is very very similar to the one that we were looking at on the high end of option three back in the past. Um, it's it's extremely similar to that, uh, and it's at the cost of the low end of option three. Um, a lot of that has to do with. 
uh, the rubberized ground, uh, portion of the rubberized ground we're going to be putting in. Um, we're being very selective and strategic in that uh, and not using a, a blanket theory to cover the whole surface. Um, but just the surfaces that are needed, and that's that's what saved uh, the most bang for our buck there. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to any questions, concerns, comments. I just have one question. That satellite playground we have right now um, includes several swings that are very popular. Um, so is that something that is looked to possibly being brought in, since we're going to have to move that down? onto the playground, and I know it's really tight out there, I think, so trying to factor that in as well with all the students. It is extremely tight there, you're correct. And um, I've looked at many options, what I can do. I know we just made some changes to our traffic flow to try to get people off of Bear Creek Road and Schaefer and doing what we can on that end, um, trying to grow that and see if there's any possibility in the future that we can includes swing possibly in area um, that's still work in progress for me and um, th that's going to take a while to try to get with the principal dr. Stedler and uh, see what options he may have uh, moving forward there so I'm I would be remiss if I said I hadn't thought about it but um, it's I wanted to get this presented to you first and um, we're trying to keep the footprint as small as possible without losing that. Uh, we're still looking at, uh, I know, f phase two had fencing um, that we were already allocated for that, and that was approved. And I'm trying to figure out how I can either possibly move some of the equipment into that area that's currently in the satellite playground, uh, what the cost is. Um, I'm still working on that end. The other thing that we want to be concerned about, of course, is, is swings uh, in an area where you've got somebody sitting in a wheelchair. Um, that's that's another concern. How do we separate that uh, so that somebody doesn't get plowed into? Uh, any other questions or concerns? Um, you mentioned the um, phase two. So with the uh, the financial piece with this, that is completely separate from the other two phases. This would just be the cost for phase three, correct? Yes, ma'am. Um, and so we are still on track to take care of the fencing and redoing. Um, we had talked about that parking lot that we were yes. going to be putting up some extra things, so that was an extra play area. Would we need that extra play area still um, if we were to go with, say, phase, or, um, option two? It depends who you talk to. Um, <laughs> I, I think you need it. Um, I know the school was designed without a thought of a playground at all, and uh, the footprint wasn't set up for any playground, so anything we do is going to take additional work and additional costs. But um, yeah, the amount of students we currently have at Bear Creek, I think whatever we can do to help them grow that playground area would be would be worthwhile. And so the intent with that area was to be like basketball area, correct? Correct. I'm yes. trying to remember because we don't have it up right yes, here. Correct. So that would be the basketball area. We would then have that fenced in um, where we have the gates so that it can be utilized as it needs to in the mornings. but the rest of the day it would be sectioned off for the students. Correct, yes, it would be and completely then, sectioned off for students, uh, only used for drop off and pick up. Okay, um, so this would just, and what was the first two phase? How much did we, do you remember how much that was, Tom? Sorry, I'm putting you on the spot. Come on, dude. While he's looking that up, I will like to chime in on this as well, Mrs. Lindemuth. Um, that fenced in area uh, that we're, we were contemplating taking the basketball hoops that were out back and bringing them out front and, and all that stuff. Uh, with this with this option two and being condensed as it is, we won't be sacrificing the one basketball court that we thought we were going to. So basketball will still be its own identity and we can have that parking lot used for other things as well, like dodgeball, soccer, what I, what have you, you know, so just wanted to add that in there. So there's just one basketball court, correct? There will be two. We were going to say, we were thinking we had to sacrifice one. Back with Adam's design, we were going to have to sacrifice one of the two that are there. We're no longer having to do that. I mean, would that give us more possibilities as far as putting the thing in, though? And Absolutely. Just have one. Absolutely. 
uh, and maybe you said this and I miss it, but I'm looking at slide 13, which is kind of the, like the generic blueprint drawing. Um, is this, this would be coming, this walkway would be coming straight out from the school building? Is that this rubberized surface? Yes, yeah, so pretty much if you're looking at, um, and I should have, I apologize, I should have a rendering of the side of the school, but if you come in the side entrance uh, where currently Gears is parking and the school buses, the mini buses are picking up students, dropping off students, it's directly next to the existing playground. Uh, what's there if you, if you get a chance to drive by. We looked at the original version and we saw a playground on one end and a playground on the other end with this uh, space in the middle. And uh, we all agreed that, or at least myself and the, uh, the vendors agreed that if we're putting an inclusive playground in, we should have that with the existing playground so everyone is together in a tight-knit group. So, um, yeah, you'll be walking into that sidewalk that goes more or less into the band room towards the cafeteria area. You'll be walking almost between the existing playground and the new playground. Okay, so I guess my question is, there's there's no real need for walking trails or pathways. This looks like it's kind of one large piece that comes off that sidewalk, you're saying? Correct. Thank you. Just two more quick comments, sorry. Um, first of all, thank you for all your work on rerouting Bear Creek my pickup. Pleasure. You did an amazing job with that, so thank you thank for you. that. And I know it's been run very smoothly, so thank you. Um, my second piece, too, I know I'd mentioned about the swing. Um, maybe could we get pricing on, like, an adaptive swing? We do just to move the swings down there to make it yes. more inclusive. Yes, we so. can do. I'll do yep, anything. We'll get pricing. Just I know it might be in the future yet, yeah, but maybe to see what that cost would be, because I think that would be a nice feature to add in. To include. Sir, agreed. So. Is there anything further? And I'll thank you, Jim, and you can stay put because I'm gonna be going to my next topic. So the next topic we have on the agenda for tonight is a property discussion. Um, this property came to us uh, bef before um, with an opportunity to buy it. It's, it, it involves a, a Bainbridge. It's the next door property. Um, it's three acres. Bainbridge sits on six acres. So we would be um, half again our size. Um, not quite doubling it, but a third. Um, and so uh, uh, I alluded you guys to this during the executive session, but I'd like to bring it to your attention in the public in the public eye for discussion tonight. Um, I will be I will be asking to put it on the agenda for next uh, meeting for the for the voting session, um, as it it is time sensitive. So I can't I can, I know we have feasibility and all that stuff going on, but this is time sensitive. So I, I'd like to I'd like to get through it as as quick as possible um, out of respect for uh, the elderly woman that's involved in this thing. So uh, with that, um, just a quick overview again. Uh, this is uh, the property next to May Bainbridge. Um, I walked through this property. Um, I walked through this property at, with a contractor's mind, uh, trying to get a feel for what I would bid on it uh, in terms of um, renovations if we were to use it as an, as an ADA accessible, um, how to give uh, students that are handicapped an opportunity to, to live independently and experience what that's like, um, doing dishes, doing laundry, uh, cooking, uh, and what it would take to convert this home in, in that kind of space. Uh, as well, the reason why we're looking at this property is because we have a bottleneck in terms of um, drop off and pick up. Uh, right now, the situation is that the parents that are coming in their cars um, they're sitting out on the road waiting to drop off the children and it's having the buses. The buses are empty, by the way. <laughs> um, but it's having buses going to oncoming traffic on the other side of the road to get into the loop that they're required to get into in order to onward off the children. So, um, so it's creating a hazard there. 
uh, this would alleviate that uh, because we would put a loop around the house on the property uh, that parents would then use and we would probably be cost effective in using pea gravel to do to do the, such a, such a thing um, that's the biggest reason why we're looking at this um, we're also looking at this property because it's 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 solar efficient um, the whole property is powered by solar and that gives us an avenue to to file for grants um, this is three acres so if we took uh, essentially a quarter of that and built a, uh, a solar field now we're powering Bingbridge by solar which is an immense saving over the course of just one single year uh, we could potentially be um, making making savings enough in uh, you know some short five or six years to pay for the property you know the price tag for the property um, with that I just want to uh, turn over to Tom for you guys um, and he'll give you the financial aspects of this thing Thank you, Mr. Emery. <clears throat> the property is next to Bainbridge Elementary. The cost is four sixty two three hundred, and that is non negotiable at this time. Okay, so four sixty two three hundred. Uh, Tom, did we did we ever uh, uh, find out what the next door neighbor on the other side of that what that sold for? Uh, it was still in negotiations the last I checked. It was started with an auction, then it was back and forth, but I did not did not have the final at this point. As soon as I do, I'll let you know. Okay. So um, I just wanted to make you guys aware that um, through my calculated estimations, um, it's going to be around anywhere from sixty-five dollars to $75,000 to renovate the home, uh, to get ADA ramp put in, uh, to get the uh, turnaround put in, to uh, uh, make the uh, the kitchen and uh, one of the bathrooms a client. Um, things like doorknobs need to be changed to lever style. Cabinets need to be uh, at a lower height uh, to be um, a wheelchair accessible. Uh, the stove has to be wheelchair accessible, which means you have to have something that you can pull up to and have, have your feet underneath it. Um, those kinds of things um, and with that um, it also included uh, an HVAC HVAC system in ter in in place of uh, an oil burning furnace which we absolutely don't want to have um, so I came up with that number um, uh, walking with Tom and with Jim and then I asked Jim our, our director of operations to come up with numbers as to the upkeep of the property throughout the course of the year. Jim, would you enlighten us with that? Uh, per my conversations with the water authority, we would look be looking at about $240 a year for water. Uh, sewer would be $105 per quarter, so $420 per year on that. The electricity current being currently being used there with the salt field existing out back. Um, they were sending 10 to $20 per month for, for electric utility. If we change that from the boiler unit and the heating oil unit to a complete HVAC system, um, I don't have the exact numbers on that, but I think we could get up to between $70 you know, a, a month, I would think, on average, with solar helping to offset any additional costs on that. So um, we would probably look at around to $2,500 annually in utilities. Uh, currently, we're loading up a mower here and driving over to Bainbridge to mow. If we had that property, they have a, a three bay uh, shop out back. We could house two mowers and some weed eaters out there that would cut our time considerably till we're loading up equipment, unloading equipment. Once we get to Bainbridge and then do the mowing, uh, it would almost nullify the the time to use. So um, there would be wear and tear on equipment and gasoline purchases. I would say probably around $2,500 a year 
into that as well then too would be put on top of that. So for about $5,000 a year, uh, we we cover the, our costs at that facility. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Tom, could you uh, enlighten us as to um, our financial ability, um, what we, what we're looking at, what we have set aside, and what it's allocated for specifically, um, you know, in light of uh, uh, everything else that we've got going on, um, what is the money specifically for, and, and how quickly do we have to use it? The board authorized the uh, issuance of bonds uh, for $15 million to replace the cash we were going to spend for the athletic construction project. Uh, you sold the bonds for a little over $16 million. So instead of the $15 million that we owe back, we made six, a little bit over, we made an extra million dollars. Now, the extra million dollars has to go into capital reserve because that's what we, we issued the bonds saying that we must use it for capital projects. So a capital project listing in the bonds is anything to do with repair, replacement, build new, or buy property. So any of those uh, Things can, it can be used for. At this time, once the athletic construction project is done, we should have a balance of around six million dollars. Um, could be a little bit more than that, depending on if the construction project comes in under budget. Uh, we don't know that at this point because it's not completed. So, so we will have six million dollars remaining. The uh, as you know, we borrowed it with the uh, ability to be able to make more on interest than what we're paying on interest. So as of since June 2nd, 3rd, whenever we received the bond funds, we have been making at least 1% more on the money that, than what we're paying out to the uh, bondholders. So we will continue that practice. With, that with the agreement with the IRS is that you must use the funds in three years from date of receiving. So that means we have until June of 27 to use the funds. As long as we use it for what it says, we will be able to keep the, what I would say, interest profit from that. So if you decide that this is something you want to do with uh, some of the $6 million that's in the bond to be used, that is acceptable. Thank you. So do we have any questions, comments, concerns? I'll open it up to the board. Tom, for the bonds, um, I know that we are allowing it to sit there and earn the interest. How would that be affected if we took some of this out and utilized that? That would decrease our earning, correct? By the $600,000, yes, it would decrease the amount of interest that we're earning from the point of that we'd actually have to pay for the purchase of the house, correct. What's that estimate annually on that? I know. I'm really pushing you today. I'm so sorry. I did not anticipate this. I have no idea at this point, but I can do some calculations to figure it out. The computer's running really slow. It really it's not is. not the Wi-Fi. It is board box. I've just checked on that. Yeah. Uh, what it would be is currently we're earning, uh, I just checked on this last week. For some reason, one of the banks that we're investing with likes us, and when the Federal Reserve dropped the rates, they didn't drop ours yet. So we're still at 5.25 on something that we're paying 3.5 on. So we're still doing very well on our money. It will drop. Our anticipation is that it'll drop to about four eight. We'll still be earning a little over a percent. Uh, sometime, if everything goes according to what it looks like at this point, sometime in February we'll be at the four mark. At that point, we will freeze that interest rate for a year uh, because we will be okay with not borrowing. So I would need to know by February that we're going to use some of it. Uh, six hundred thousand dollars on six million really is not a lot of interest to lose. Uh, I can do the calculation for you, but you're looking at about 1% on 600000 So we'd still be able to um, afford the payments there would with be the no, interest? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. You'll still be over. You'll be work, still be earning more money on interest than what the payment is. Paying it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Strickler, um, so we have six million in there. How much of that has to be spent by June twenty twenty seven? All of it, or all just of it. all of it? All of it. Or if you don't spend it, you must pay the IRS back on all the profit we made from the interest. So we really would lose a lot at that point. I have a question. 
uh, as it relates to staffing. I don't, don't, don't know what the answer is. Do we currently have life skills staff? Do we current, or are we looking to, would this require us if we decide to use it for that teaching purpose? Uh, do, would this require an additional staff member or do we have the staff to do this currently now? So at the moment, we have that fully staffed. You may remember last year, that was one of the positions that we did need to add an additional life skills teacher because our numbers um, went up in that particular class. It's something we evaluate on a year by year basis. So I can't say for certain that we will never need another life skills staff member, but right now we have that fully covered, but we evaluate that each year. And then Dr. Smith brings a recommendation to us because there are certain ratios we have to have when it comes to special education. So that's part of the mandates. And what, and forgive my lack of remembrance here, but the current life skills class that we have, where do they meet and what rooms do they use currently? So we have two life skills classrooms here at the high school and they do a number of different activities both within the school as well as within the community to work on the goals that they're that align with their special needs in particular. So right now we have two life skills class at our high school. Okay, I guess my question also was do they borrow rooms? Do they have look what do, what rooms are they physically using right now? Building, I guess. They have two traditional classrooms that are assigned to those two teachers. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Strickler, just a question about that um, six million. I think you said that we need to spend by 2027. Um, so are there any projects coming up that kind of are earmarked that we would need to spend that money? I mean, like we had the emergency with the middle school heating system last year. I mean, would that be something that that money could be used for and like the Bear Creek playground, would that be something that we could use it for? If I can correct myself from a minute ago, it's $7 million that we have left. 15 minus nine is seven. So because we got the extra, I was uh, 16 minus nine. Remember we got the extra million and I was using 15 in my head. Uh, yes, we do have other projects. The inclusive playground that you just looked at, uh, will definitely, that will come out of there. Uh, we, if you remember in the feasibility study, we had uh, Crabtree go to all of our buildings. And the one that I have the biggest concern on is one thing that you don't want to do in a school district. Uh, Mr. France will have, you know, no hair at all when it's over if we don't do this. One project at a time and not have him concentrating on two different sets of contractors, two different buildings, and also trying to move students from out of two different places. So. Uh, Crabtree has recommended that we look very strongly at East High's HVAC system. Uh, so that will be looking at uh, this year for potential in the summer of 2026. Uh, that would be a fairly hefty price to completely, and not end it, to completely do, to do it right. Replace it, get it correct, and uh, then you'll, you've got a 20 year system and not have to worry about it down the road. I'll, I'll keep the, the board uh, abreast of what's going on with that. Um, we, we do have things in motion. Um, we have other companies coming in, um, doing assessments, things like that. Um, uh, and I will be, uh, part of, uh, a presentation, uh, by those companies. Uh, I'm not at liberty to, to release that as of yet. Um, but I certainly will as soon as we've got our ducks in a row with that. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to make you aware of that. And I believe that was part of the feasibility study is to look at the upgrading that. I mean, that was one of those items that was on there. So that's if we can use that and take that out of that. Okay. Mr. Franz, um, should we purchase this property? And it's still up in the air. Should we purchase it um, with the renovation? Would that be something that you'd be looking to do through CoStars um, with a price tag that high? It, I know that it would have to be done um, with prevailing wage and things like that. So um, is that something that you would anticipate going out to bid or would we look to co-stars for that mostly? It's a great question. Um, I hadn't gotten that far on, on my thoughts on that. I was taking it one step at a time to see if we were going to move forward with it at all. But um, I almost want to break up into a concrete company mm -hmm. coming in, making sure our ADA compliance is great for ac accessibility and egress, mm -hmm. getting in and out of the facility. Um, company to come in separate. Um, I would think if we diversify 
and have a different contractor come in, we would we would be able to save funds in okay. a in a positive way. So, All right, thank you. having having said that as well, um, uh, through investigation with Adam uh, prior to to Mr. France coming on board, we discovered that um, in terms of co-stars. Uh, the, the give and take number with that is 125,000. So if anything is over 100, let me explain. If anything is over 125,000, it benefits us to put it out to bid because we're going to have to spend around $10,000 to put it out to bid outside of CoStar. Okay. Uh, we've got to put it, we've got to broadcast it in the paper a few times, this, that, and the other. There's, there's a bunch of hoops that we have to jump through for that. So, um, if it's at 125,000 or better, then it benefits us to do that because we'll be outside of co-stars. We're going to get better bids. We're, they're not cornering the market, so to speak. Anything that's under 125,000, we'd like to keep inside of co-stars because we think we'll benefit that way. So just just uh, just putting that food for thought to you. 125 seems to be the the number that keeps us in or out of it. Anything else? Okay, so I will be uh, um, putting this up uh, for a vote uh, on, on the next agenda uh, in two weeks, as far as the property goes. Um, I also wanted to uh, comment uh, on the feasibility study uh, very quickly. Um, uh, this feasibility study is immense. Um, we're looking at really big numbers, and it's rather scary to the community. Um, it's rather scary to us as board members. Um, I, I want to let you know that this is this is not even in its infancy stage yet. Uh, we're just courting the idea at this point. Um, having said that, you know, we sooner than later we're going to have to start thinking about funds for this. However, um, there are tons and tons and tons of questions, tons and tons of investigation, tons and tons of gray areas that we have to bring light to um, before we could even put it on the table as, as, as something even credible in my mind at this point. Um, the presentation that was, that was made had a lot of gray area in terms of the remodel of this building. Um, not so much new construction of a of of a new uh, facility, but there were there were just way too many things left out in terms of you know uh, possible uh, lead paint, uh, possible asbestos, um, things of that nature. When you're dealing with a building that dates back to 1955 in some sections of this building, um, the HVAC units. Um, the 2.7 miles of gas line that we have sitting on our, our roof, what do we do with that? Um, the septic system that's got bellies in it that's virtually inaccessible without disturbing uh, class. All those things still need answers um, on top of what was presented in a feasibility study. So I just want to put everybody's mind in the right perspective here. Um, I got some emails. Um, over the last couple of weeks talking about, you know, they, they made me feel like uh, it was it was an assumption that we, was gonna, we were going to break ground, you know, maybe next summer on this thing. No, uh, there, there's all kinds of conversations still to have. So be patient, uh, be alert, be aware. Uh, we'll keep you informed. And with that, I yield back to the president. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Emery. Moving on, we go to Educational Planning and Student Services Committee. So, Mrs. Carter, you're up. All right, thank you, Mr. Lindemuth. Just a quick update to our science curriculum. Um, as I shared earlier, um, I guess a couple months ago now, we updated our um, some of our other technology curriculum. The Steels Science, Technology, Engineering, Environmental Liter Literacy, and Sustainability are all the new standards that the PA um, wants us to put in effect by July 1st of next year. So we're updating all of our science standards. So the K through uh, two curriculum is what's presented there. We got a chance to look over that, the scope and sequences, 
uh, and the curriculum guides. Um, and does anyone have any questions about any of those that were presented? Okay, so they'll be on the agenda for the action meeting on the 22nd then. Okay, thank you. So moving right along to finance committee, uh, a couple items there to discuss and Ms. Linda Muth. I'm going to hand it over to Mr. Strickler for our finance presentation for the feasibility study. And hopefully it's gonna work for him. Thank you, Ms. Linda. I don't know if Ms. Griffith could do a much better job at finance. You did awesome tonight in uh, letting us know what you need in the high school. That's great. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Tonight, what I'd like to do is we'll go back to uh, Mr. Emery's comments about the uh, feasibility study. Uh, feasibility study was a huge presentation, uh, along with a lot of big, th big numbers after it at the end. I think that we need to break down into smaller chunks. So this is part one of three presentations on let's look at the finance side of the feasibility study. I don't have as glitzy pictures or anything like that, but I think how do we get there? So what I thought I'd do is break this down into a very small chunk. The slides that you see tonight may not be exactly the same next month, but they'll have the same information. So we're gonna grow it. So start small, we'll grow it a little bit bigger. So our alignment to board goals, we're going to create a five-year financial plan to include operations, education, including renovation and instruction. And goal three, we're going to identify and remove the barriers to help students grow educationally, emotionally, and socially, and for staff to thrive and succeed. Our alignment to pillars is going to be student learning, well-being, and effective systems. So if we go to the next slide, what we're going to start on is family planning process for financial impact for a major purchase. So we're gonna establish the process of what you and I, a family of four, would use to, for a large purpose, needing savings over a period of time. Next slide. So preparation for the major purchase, we, got, we have to identify the goal, <coughs> look at our current situation, what do we need to get from here to there? How do we get there? What are the specific, the hard word, commitments we have to make annually? The harder word for all of us that have families, especially with children. What are the changes and modifications we need to make now and along the journey and at arrival? What are our long-term commitments after arrival, it seems that, oh, we bought it, now it stops. We all know the price tag continues, the 30-year mortgage, we all know about those. And then what are the financial needs and impact to our family and to us personally? And of course, before we make the final decision, what are the options? <clears throat> so the plan, what do we want to purchase? What's our goal? Next slide. We're currently renting at $2,500 per month, and our family of four would like to own a $500,000 home. Next slide. So let's lay out where we are. We have to really do an accounting. What do we currently have? Two-parent income family, each earning $50,000 a year for $100,000. They both anticipate a 3% annual pay increase for each income. One parent is willing to get a part time 20 hours a week, $20 per hour, 50 weeks per year. Currently have a small savings account of $5,000. They've already looked to see if they could expand the rentals. They could not expand their current two bedroom ap apartment with $2,500 a month in rent plus utilities. There's nothing to expand because the rental market is extremely tight. Their goal is to purchase and move in five years. So it lays out where they're at, where they wanna go, what their time period is. Next slide. Again, the tough part. Cannot waver or modify. They lay out a landscape of what's going to happen if they say, we want that goal. 
They must be committed to the income. They must maintain the budget plan, revenue, and expense. They must have that annual routine. No unplanned purchases. No crews in the middle of the plan. The potential consequences, if they alter at all, if they change their commitment long or short term, the timeline changes for attaining the goal. As some of you have already said about the, the feasibility study, you change the timeline by a year, what's the cost going to do? Or is the house, the new home still available in the development or does the development fill up? Now the, the, the change of plans, you're still not, you're no longer in the town school district. You may have to go somewhere else. That's, the, that's another thing that they're considering with children. Uncontrollable issues. The goal may have to be modified if you change your plan a long way. Um, or the goal may no longer be attainable. As we saw just recently, when interest rates were 3% and now they're 8%, that goal may not be attainable anymore because they don't have the sustainable income for the payment of the mortgage. So what do they have to do? for that goal. Next slide, down payment is $100,000, 20% of a $500,000 purchase. Closing costs, normally 5%, so 5% of a $400,000 loan, $20,000, must have a 700 score. The sustainable income and savings long-term after arrival. Their mortgage payment versus rent payment. So it's not just thinking that five years, what do I have to do? Well, I'm done, I can leave. It's the long term. So they now go from $3,500 or $2,500 a month in rent to $3,500 in a mortgage payment. Their insurance costs, they had renter's insurance for homeowners. Whole different world, a lot of different costs. The uh, home cost changes, maintenance repairs versus landlord pays. Taxes. No property taxes on a rental, but there is on your home. Purchases, if an appliance goes bad, the landlord replaces it. Not in your home. Appliance goes bad, it's on you. Upgrades, maybe they want to do something else down the road. They have to think of those payments as well. Next slide. How do we get there? What's the map look like? Get the road map, map out. We have a specific direction with an annual commitment. Financial changes, modification today and on the journey. And we have to mental, mentally get ready for it because all of you that have had children, grandchildren, they always want to modify your budget. No matter what, they want to modify your budget. It's no different in the, in, a, in the school district or is it at home. There's always those pressures to modify the budget. They've got to be ready now to say we're sticking with this. So the specific direction plan. Next slide. Their income is going to increase by 3% annually. They're going to keep 1% of that to go to regular income living expense because they do a lot. 2% of it is going into their savings account to reach their goal. The second job, 100% of the annual $20,000 is going into the goal. They're going to maintain their current spending level. Let me repeat that. They're going to maintain their current spending level. They're going to anticipate modifications. Car breaks down. The car needs repairs. Things of that nature. You've got to anticipate some of that. And they have to prepare for a long-term sustainable goal. Now this first next slide is a little bit small. It'll get bigger as we go. So we're going to lay out a nine-year plan. The first line is, going to, is their income as they increase at 3% from year 2024. To year 2033, they're going to go from $100,000 in income to $130,000 in income. Each year they have an increase of the 3%. Regular income is only going to increase 1%. So if you look down at the bowl line, uh, at the very bottom line, it says annual income or living expenses. So at the top, I told you they went from $100,000 to $130,000. Actual income that they're going to use, they're going only to $110,000. So they're not using the 130 annual income for living. They're using it toward the goal. Next slide. Let's go to the first five years. 
So this slide shows you what they're going to do to attain their goal in five years. They're going to put 1% of their income toward their regular living and then their savings income. So if you look across to the very last column in year five, they're going to have $30,900 from the 2% savings. The extra job is going to give them 100000 So if we go back and look at cost, the $130,915 covers their cost of purchase. That was their goal. As long as they maintained that budget, it covered their cost. If you look across the bottom, 1% a year is what they received for regular income, for regular living expense. Next slide. Year six to nine, this is the piece that you have to maintain or you can't make the mortgage payment and property taxes and insurance and all of that. So after the purchase in year five, they're going to have $10,900 left in their savings. Here's where they can modify just a little bit. They can flip the two to two percent instead of one percent in the regular living, they can go to two percent in the regular living and put one percent in the savings account. They come out at the end of year nine with an additional thirty three thousand dollars in their savings account by doing that and then continuing that job, they'll get receive another eighty thousand. So at the end of nine years after purchasing the house, they'll have about one hundred twenty five thousand dollars in the bank which helps pay for those appliance breaking, uh, other things that they need to do around the home. So it's the sustainable income over a period of nine years. At that point, they can look at what their sustainable income is, what their regular earning is, and go from there as do you drop the job, second job, do you only cut your hours in half, how do you want to do it? That's really the call at that point. But that's a nine-year plan, sustainable, to come to that. So look at the next time, as I just went over, what do you do after nine years, reduce number of hours, uh, change your 2% of your income for an emergency fund. Uh, now you can look at planning a vacation because you have the extra money to do it, you've reached your goal, and you now have a sustainable income. Next slide. So I said at the beginning, the very last slide that we have to look at is what, do the, what are the options today that that family has? First option is they move toward their goal, they make the commitment, they set the budget, and they start moving forward. Second option, modify the goal. Let's go to a smaller house, used house, much less pricey, and much less price with potential higher long-term costs, repairs, additions, possibly remodeling for the, to fit the entire family, less, less efficient, higher utilities. And their final option is do nothing, stay in the apartment. That's the uh, sort of a presentation that we start today with the family. We'll move up as we go in the next month. Any questions that you have, anything else that you want to see so that I can add as we go? So looking over this, just making sure that I'm understanding it, um, with the extra job, what you're saying is that not only are they going to have the regular income of $100,000, one of them is going to need to get a second job. That was what they agreed to up front when they said they wanted to go for that goal. Yes. Okay. Just making sure because yes. that wasn't yeah, – didn't quite understand I, uh, that in the first one. I missed that. So, um, and then bringing it back towards the idea of a school district, we need to maintain current spending. So that's something that – this is as much of a question as it is um, something to be thinking about. If that's something that we're going to be doing, that's something that – it can't just come from the board. That has to be something that um, we need to remember as a school district that these are taxpayer funds, and we have to be fiscally responsible. So if we're maintaining spending, we have to look at how that's going to work. So that would be a, a, an admonition to, as we're looking through this whole stability study, how are we as a district going to plan that out? Um, because we do have the increased costs of 3% for our faculty and staff, we do have increased costs for other things. And so um, how do we have the ability? We have to have the ability to look at this and take it, obviously, you're going to, over the next couple of months, take that into the larger picture. But we really need to be thinking about that now, that while this is fantastic what you've done, thank you for breaking this down into a, a manageable um, and more audible experience for us. 
we do have to think of it as the school district and that these are taxpayer funds that we are being given to do our best with that we possibly can. So thank you for making it easier to understand. And just a reminder, they're not maintaining the exact same thing. They're taking 1% a year of their increase. So I think in today's world, it's impossible to say, we'll stay at $100,000 for the next nine years. Our current income was too good, whatever. So it is a 1% move. So it's a little bit, and we'll show that as we move forward. Any other questions or comments? The income increase, is that representing, I don't know if I'm looking at this correctly, is that representing a tax hike, income e increase 3%? The income, this is a family. All I'm, I know. No, I'm, I'm, I'm trying I'm not to, trying to in, no, I'm not trying to represent anything for the school district. Okay. What I'm trying to, what I'm hoping to do with this is that we all understand exactly what we would go through if this is their art goal and what we want to do. Don't take this any further than, oh, where does this fit in the feasibility study? Because it's, it's bigger numbers, larger numbers, so I'm just trying to get it down to what would we do personally and how would we make a nine-year plan? That's really all it is. And then just hold that and I'll come back next month with what the school district okay. would do. Okay, so don't. But I do, do just want to say my first um, instinct to say these people are going to be house poor and they didn't buy that $500,000 home because that's crazy. They obviously cannot afford it. Thank you, <laughs> Mr. Strickland. All right, any other questions before we move on to the next thing? All right, so Mr. Strickler, I believe you're going to discuss Act 1. Ready to learn adequacy. That's it. So we're going to do a little presentation. This one should be fairly easy. Uh, this is about creating a five-year financial plan as well. The pillar on this one is the effective systems. And we can go to slide number four, which is the... There we go. Spreadsheet. Okay, if you remember, you know, just a few short months ago, we did a, a little budget, little thing called the budget, 24-25. And in that budget, we did planning for local real estate, planning for uh, the state income, and of course, the little bit that the federal government gives us. In the state income plan, we all were told that we were going to get more money from the state because they were lost a court battle and... They were going to give some more money to help make up for that. Well, they did. Uh, the school, they found in their system one-ninth of what the court said that they owed the schools. One-ninth is nothing magic. It just happened to be how much money they came up with this year. There's no guarantees. Next year could be zero. Next year could be one-eighteenth. Could be one-twentieth. No one knows. It's every year, whatever they, wherever they can find some extra money. With that being said, what I assumed when I did the budget was when the state's going to give us more money, it usually either goes to basic ed or special ed. Well, the state came up with a new category. They've been giving us ready-to-learn grant for years, and we've been getting $472,997 for all of those years. Well, they came up with two buckets <coughs> inside ready-to-learn grant. One is called adequacy funding and the other was called tax equity. They renamed the $472,000 that we're getting, or we've been receiving, to legacy. So the legacy they're telling us will continue on and on no matter what. So that's the first 72 we will continue to get. The adequacy funding this year for E-Town is $394,880. That may or may not be here next year. Maybe more, maybe less. Why they put it in ready to learn, I'm not sure, but that's what they put, which means uh, Mr. Schwarzman, who does a lot of our grant writing, has to actually apply for that. It doesn't just magically come as a check like basic ed does. He has to go through the work and process of applying, and we have to provide financials. And then the tax equity piece, E-Town does not get. There's only about 5% of the districts in the state of Pennsylvania that qualify for tax equity. 
I've given you a couple slides. I am not going to go over it. It has been there the same forever. It's about how you can use ready to learn money. So again, it's not here we owe you money because Bunder funds you for years. We're going to give you more in basic ed. It's we're going to give you more, but you have to qualify for it type thing. So if we go to slide nine, it's Elizabethtown Act One Index Historical. And what I've given you here is the Act One for 25, 25, 26. I got to remember what year we're in. 25, 26 has been released. The Act One Index is 4%. Because of our uh, equity, we are at 5%. I want to point out something here just so you can see that Elizabethtown is dropping in the free and reduced lunch area and our be between our property rate, property value going up, personal income is also going up in E-Town. Because of those two going up, we're actually dropping in the amount we receive over the index. So last year the index was 5.3 we were able to raise taxes to 6.6. .6. This year, the index is four. We're allowed to go to five. So we're 1% over the actual index. So we are dropping a little bit. That means higher personal income and higher property values. So I hope it's not too confusing. It confused me. I had to look at it again just to make sure we had it right. So what I've given you is the Act 1 index in Elizabethtown over, since 2013-2014. Why is that important? Well, one little caveat that the legislators put at the end of the adequacy fund. If you want the 300 plus thousand dollars, you cannot go over Act 1 index. So this is extremely difficult in many school districts because if you need excess money to go over Act 1 because you're not receiving enough from the state, you literally are telling the state, we're not going to take your money because we need more money. It, it's very difficult to understand. I'm not sure why, but I want to make sure that you all understand that this, why we're moving Act 1 from to approve last year not to exceed it in December. I need it in October because Mr. Schwarzman cannot apply for this unless you tell him we will not exceed Act 1. So that's the new rule. So now it's a new rule coming on that we have to move this up because if he applied for it and you later decided to exceed Act 1, we'd have to send it back. That makes sense. So questions, comments? So at the next meeting, we're going to be looking for direction for um, the district as to whether or not we're going to anticipate needing to exceed the Act 1 index. So over the next two weeks as we're reviewing the board docs and we're getting the new docs, that's something that you'll want to be looking at to make the decision um, what direction do we as a board want to instruct the district as to where we want to go with the Act 1 index. Can I just ask a quick question? So this money that is linked to the Act 1 index is the new category that they made correct will still continue to get legacy money the really of it but the act one is specifically linked to the adequacy supplement is that correct Cor the act one and sh sh should we down the road ever get it the tax equity oh, that, both right. of those now the act one or i'm sorry the adequacy is for next year so it would be the 25 26 you can't exceed act one should we ever get tax equity it's for the following year so it's two years in a row that you couldn't exceed if you got both but I don't see us ever going to the tax equity. So, yes, it's adequacy only. We will still receive, no matter what, the 472. And just really to follow up with that, so the 2024-25 amount that's listed here, we're already, that's for this year, correct? 472,000 is for this year. 394,000 is also for this year. However, if the board says we want to exceed act on next year, you don't get the 394. I understand. Thank you. And that's we don't get the 394 for this year. Correct. So if we exceed next year's Act 1, they take away this year's money. Correct. Don't you love Harrisburg? Any other questions? All right. 
I think it takes us on to Act 1 decision. We kind of discussed that. Do we need to discuss any more about that? My only thing there is there's a presentation attached to the uh, board docs strictly for your benefit. I didn't put a big spreadsheet up on here. It has the same that I showed you, the historical of e -Town. It had every school district in Lancaster County. So you can compare us for the last 11 years. If he had, audience, if he had put that up for you guys, you been able to see it. So it is in public section. Go look at it there. All right. Any other questions before we move on to the donation? All right. Um, so the last thing we have is a donation from the Elizabeth Area Education Association. It is a monetary donation of $1,000 from the Genes for Cause program for the Facility Dog program. We're really thankful that um, the association has decided to help fund that. So thank you guys very much. And we'll be voting on that at the next meeting unless anybody has any questions. All right, with that, I am done. Okay, thank you, uh, everyone, uh, Mr. Strickler and everyone, Danielle, for your <clears throat> input there. We are moving to our last, uh, pol our last uh, committee item here, which is policy. So we will turn it over to Mr. Gillis at this time. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, for this session, we have uh, uh, five policies that are up for a second review. Um, policies are as listed, student dis and weapons, terroristic threats, school calendar, and child abuse. Uh, for this section of policies, well, I have not received any additional comments on for these, so my recommendation is we'll let these go through to, uh, to the end where we approve them at the next meeting. And that's all I have. Any questions on any of those? policies. Okay, if there's no questions. Uh, that was a quick, quick one as well. So uh, we are ready for reports uh, from outside partnerships at this time. And we will start with the IU 13. Uh, Mrs. Strom. Great. Thank you, Mr. Linda Muth. So our last meeting was September 11th at the Lancaster Center. Um, and it was actually quite a bit shorter agenda than a lot of the meetings. So I don't have quite as much to share tonight. But um, we began with committee workshops. Um, all the reports were given then as the full board gathered to meet. Early childhood special education, they were still waiting on, they were still waiting to hear on approval of a continuation grant that was submitted for. Um, hopefully by now they actually have the result. This was almost a month ago now. Um, Central Education Center in Mannheim was actually planning to and preparing for their first open house that they've had in several years. We're excited about that. Um, school year's off to a good start, 24, 25 year, despite the staff shortages. The leadership team has been working together to cover the responsibilities and to find a replacement for Ann Riker, who had passed away last month that I had shared about. Um, under human resources, the board approved uh, numerous business contracts and personnel actions also. We also voted to approve an increase in the daily substitute job trainer pay rate. So recognitions, uh, Karen Peterson, who is administrative assistant for human resources, was recognized on her retirement. Um, she had been there a number of years and I think she's going to be missed, certainly. Um, Mr. Stem, the executive director, he provided a report. Some things that he um, included were uh, he gave acknowledgement to 402 combined years of employee experience and dedication in the speech language pathology department. So that's pretty awesome. Lots of years experience there. Uh, recognition, of four, recognition of 40 years of service for Cindy Whitmer. Um, she'd been there she, for a number of obviously 40 years, but she started in the IU and had actually worked her way up to level two um, uh, interpreter. So it's really um, quite an accomplishment, 40 years. 
updates he gave on technology management career interns, also non-public math academy, and PBAAS statewide team leaders summit. So he just provided some updates on all of those events. Affinity Partnership, this is really cool, um, with Elizabethtown College, and they give 15% tuition um, reduction on anybody that, you know, participates in classes through Elizabethtown College, and currently there are 29 people with the IU that are enrolled in Etown classes and taking benefit of that 15% tu tuition reduction, so I thought that was great. Um, I'd like to share one of the many, there's so many different things that we hear of, of happenings that go on within the IU, and I thought was really cool to share, was in September there was a survival and wilderness challenge. Um, naturalist Lisa Sanchez taught survival skills in the wilds of Lancaster County Park. Students learned that things needed in a survival situation are food, water, shelter, and fire. They explored them all in teams, and students had the opportunity to build a shelter. They also practiced the vital skills of teamwork, problem solving, and collaboration. So there were 20 participants from the following districts, Cocalico, Lanco, Our Elizabethtown, Hemfield, Lake Peter Strasburg, Mannheim Township, School District of Lancaster, Solanco, and Warwick. So I thought that was really cool. Next meeting is actually tomorrow evening at the Lancaster Center. It's my report. All right, thank you. Moving on, uh, Lancaster County CTC, Mr. Riggleman. Yeah, I'll kind of fill you in. Um, <clears throat> the last month, I was traveling the United States, so to do the online thing and trying to speak and uh, it was really hard to do so I kept it to the, to, to the night to kind of bring up to speed with CTC um, the first thing they had a problem with was a electrical outage um, underground electrical line that that shorted and they had to bring in back in backup generators to keep the school moving forward um, and then they had a water issue, which the school got flooded, and then they had a lot of water damage and they were working through that. And Stewart wrote a letter that there's still black cloud over top of CTC, that they're going through a lot of issues and working through them, accomplishing uh, their goals of trying to keep the school open. And then if you uh, heard on the news, they had a threat in the school district they in, in the ctc school that they actually had to shut down the school um and they uh did an investigation they got the school back opened and they're still uh, they're still today still investigating some parts of that um so ctc it just seems like after they, uh, through one issue there's a next one coming up uh hopefully uh the sun will come out on CTC and things will kind of uh, get back to normal. And uh, so I have a meeting with them uh, Thursday, this uh, fourth Thursday of this month. And uh, so I'll get an update again. Um, I could not uh, connect with them this last time because I was on a 3,000 foot cliff and the Wi Fi didn't work too good. Um, and the, <laughs> I couldn't connect with them, and and uh, but I enjoyed my trip. I'm back, and uh, I'm looking forward to getting the next update from CTC. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Regelman. Uh, moving on, Mr. Reed with Lancaster County Academy. Thank you, Mr. Linda Muth. Uh, Dr. Griffin provided us with some LCA fast facts at our last meeting, and I'll share some of those. We currently have 38 students enrolled, uh, 18 new enrollments as of August. Four of those were from Elizabethtown. We have 30% uh, right now of max capacity at both the East and West Campus. And three of the schools represented are at max capacity, which is a really good thing. And we potentially have 19 graduates ready for January. So looking for a January graduation and hopefully that will take place. 
We were very sorry to hear that Dr. Felty will be re retiring in December. That was, she's done a wonderful job for the LCA leading that uh, organization. But in the meantime, we have uh, decided to hire a Dr. Ryan S. from Mannheim Central to take over the responsibilities of the superintendent of record. So uh, I think that'll be a smooth transition. We met him on Wednesday and it was a really good meeting and I think he'll prov be providing really good leadership for Lancaster County Academy. And that is pretty much it. Our next meeting will be on December the 4th. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Reed. PSBA, Mrs. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Lindemuth. I have a somewhat short report tonight as well, not too much going on. Um, PSBA does have a new school director monthly exchange. It's monthly webinars to help first term school directors build foundational knowledge and better understand their roles. So this month's exchange is entitled Setting Board Goals and will be held on October 10th from 1230 to 130. If you're interested, please log into my PSBA. You can register for that. Um, some educational news from local and federal government um, approved by the Senate Education Committee is HB 2383, Mentors for Students. This establishes older adult mentor volunteer program. To the extent that funding is available, the Pennsylvania Department of Educa Education would develop and maintain a central registry of older adult volunteers to work with students according to academic interests, professional pursuits, skills, or hobbies. Adults and students would meet before, during, or after school hours in school facilities and on school grounds. Schools are not required to participate, but those that do would identify students who benefit, benefit from this program and obtain consent from parents before linking a student to a mentor. Adult wishing to participate would be required to undergo criminal background checks and any, any other necessary requirements put forth by the school district. And passed by the House of Representatives is Healthy Hunger Free Kids Month, House Resolution 527. This designates the month of September 2024 as Healthy Hunger Free Kids Month in Pennsylvania. The resolution also supports shared table initiatives in schools for the redistribution of unused food by allowing students to put unwanted food in a specified locations that other students may take at no cost. Um, also, PS, PSSAs and Keystone exams will only be administered online beginning with the spring of 2026. No more pencil and paper tests. Um, approved by the House Education Committee, Back to School Month. House Resolution 533 designates the month of September as Back to School Month in Pennsylvania. And lastly, House Bill 2599 is called What is Your Pennsylvania Story? It requires the Pennsylvania Department of Education to the extent funding is available to develop a course for optional use by schools called What is Your Pennsylvania Story that may be incorporated into social studies instruction and general interactions with students. This course may include materials and strategies to introduce students to various cultures, unique heritages, experiences, and connections to Pennsylvania and the United States. This bill was introduced in anticipation of the United States 250th anniversary celebration in 2026. Um, and lastly, every year schools across the country spend a million using bonds or renovating and building new schools. But how do these expenditures affect students in tax paying community? A new study aims to shed some light on this subject. Analysts from the National Bureau of Economic Research use the CETA, or the Stanford Education Data Archive database, along with information from the Department of Education to gather district-wide test scores year by year, ultimately establishing a database for each state from 2003 to 2019. They also use the House Price Index to calculate changes to average home prices within the school district during that same time period. And what they found was that basic infrastructure or upgrades like HVAC systems or plumbing versus test scores, but not home prices, while building new classrooms or athletic facilities raises house prices, but not test scores. Interesting study. And that's all I have for tonight. All right, thank you, Mrs. Wilson. Finally, uh, Education Foundation, Mrs. Lindemuth. 
Education Foundation will be meeting this Friday, so at our next meeting, I should have a report. All right. Uh, thank you all for your reports. Much appreciated. Uh, at this time, I believe we are ready for public comments on uh, agenda and non agenda items. So, um, just a reminder there, you have three minutes to make your comments. Uh, please uh, hold to that standard. And uh, just, just a reminder once again to uh, keep comments civil and courteous. So uh, please address the board as well, and especially me, President. So uh, with that being said, I think we're ready to get started. Uh, again, I'll, I'll uh, announce who is up and then who is on deck, so to speak. So. We start with uh, Jim Safford, followed by Caitlin Fickus. First of all, I'd like to congratulate uh, Ms. Walsh and Ms. Griffith on their fine performance at today's uh, Model UN Conference uh, at Lampeter Strauss, they did an amazing job. As you all know, my name is Jim Safford. I'm the president of the Elizabethtown Area Education Association. I'm just here tonight to let everybody know that on Wednesday, September 25th, I was informed of the decision of the district office and the school board of directors to deny staff members the use of a PTO day or unpaid leave to attend the mass Christian burial for a cherished colleague's husband because the CBA does not allow for more than 5% of the bargaining unit absent on any given day. This despite the fact that the superintendent possesses the ability to make exceptions to this rule, especially in such extraordinary circumstances. Keep in mind that that day for which teachers requested PTO was a professional development day. Granting the teachers their PTO day would have cost the district nothing because this was a, di a student day, was not a student day, and the staff are required to make up work uh, that they miss on that day. In fact, it would have actually saved the district money as no substitutes were required. Teaching is a calling that goes beyond the classroom. Beyond the hours posted on the contract, it's a job that extends into evenings, weekends, and often personal, and most importantly, family time. Tonight, I'd like to shed light on just how much our teachers do, often unseen, acknowledged, and, and, and oftentimes unpaid. Our teachers are not just educators from 8 to 4. They are planners, mentors, and caregivers who dedicate their time and energy to ensure each student gets the best possible education. Outside of contracted hours, they attend PTO meetings, plan lessons, prepare new curriculum materials like CKLA and CKLA, sorry, Eureka Math. Their preparation doesn't stop there. Even on sick days, teachers work from home to create lesson plans and substitute materials because the learning must go on. Beyond planning, teachers spend countless hours reading papers, responding to emails from parents and students, and completing progress reports, often well into the evening. They go to great lengths to ensure that each child is supported even using personal lunch hours to help struggling student or write up Sapphire communication notes. Our teachers are deeply embedded in our community. They volunteer at evening events like book fairs, family nights, and student performances. They attend sporting events, concerts, and even funeral services to support students outside the classroom. These gestures may seem small, but they are profound. They show students that their teachers are invested in every aspect of their lives. Teachers don't just, they leave. Many serve in extra roles from piloting new programs and chairing committees to running student organizations like Lighthouse Team Minithon or chaperoning school trips and dances. These responsibilities are mostly unpaid and require additional time and energy beyond their already demanding workloads. They're also experts at managing unforeseen challenges like preparing emergency lesson plans in case of bad weather, filling out evaluations for student support, or writing grading descriptors for new curricula. All of this all of this spending nights, not hours, days. In short, our teachers give far more than what's outlined in their contracts. We would ask that the district administration and board members love your teachers okay, the thank way you. that you want and expect teachers to love their students with great respect. All right, Caitlin Fickett, you're next. Followed by Elvin Weaver.
Good evening. I'd like to express my condolences to the teacher and their family. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I'm glad the conversation continues for the inclusive playground. It looked like option three was the most inclusive and best compromise. Um, tonight, I do want to talk about the cell phone policy. I appreciate the debates and the perspectives brought up in the last month. This is an issue that we can all listen to one another on, and I applaud the decision to not use lock bags. We live in an age where technology has become an extension of ourselves. It's our duty to help ensure students navigate it safely and responsibly. So many studies have shown the negative side effects of constant cell phone use like anxiety, depression, cyberbullying, and the leading cause of accidents, distracted driving. I was really disturbed this week when a parent in the school district posted photos of the slides from the high school morning announcements regarding National Coming Out Day, an annual LGBTQ Awareness Day that has been around since 1988. These pictures were posted on a public Facebook group for the community. There have been 97 comments left on the post that is still up. Most of them are vile. Many of the comments advocate for bullying children. The school has taken steps to address this, and I value that the administration did so. No child, parent, sibling should ever have to read these horrible messages. Freedom of speech does not come mean freedom of consequence. Every student should have the opportunity to be safe being their authentic self. I know that the school board does not govern public Facebook groups, but everybody in this room is part of this shared community. And as adults in the community, we must be role models. We must demonstrate critical thinking, self-discipline, mindfulness, and our own online behavior. Safety is not just about protecting children from the risks of technology. It is about guiding them towards becoming responsible citizens. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you. Elvin Weaver is next, uh, followed by Jamie Ficus. Good evening. Uh, I don't have any comments to make. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Weaver. Uh, Jamie Ficus, you you are next, followed by Kim Kleindenst. going to work. Thanks. Good evening, members of the school board. I'd like to begin by saying how important it is to remember that every child deserves to feel safe, valued, and respected. In the words of Fred Rogers, anyone who does anything to help a child in their life is a hero to me. Tonight, I'm here because I believe, of, I believe each of you wants to be a hero of the children in our schools. A while ago, I was asked by one of you to share my concerns about the policies from the ILC and the Pennsylvania Family Institute that might negatively impact our school district. I provided that information, but it went unanswered. Now we've seen a clear result of the ILDP Family Institute and our sister city, York. At Emory H. Markle Middle School, windows were installed in a gender neutral bathroom, not for sunlight or air, but in a way that allowed others to see inside a place where children expect privacy. This decision was made following the advice from the ILC and PLPA Family Camp Institute. It caused hurt and confusion and was less than, it's less safe than before. It was only when students themselves shared the discomfort with their parents that the community knew what was happening. That those windows were finally covered up. It worries me that the changes were made without talking to the parents first, without a public vote, and without the openness that the community, that their community deserves. I did not want to see that here in Elizabethtown. Whether or not someone agrees with gender inclusive bathrooms isn't the main issue here. What matters most is that we always think about the in our care. We need to make decisions that protect their dignity and make sure every single one of them feels safe and addresses adult concerns of safety and privacy. Fred Rogers said, listening is where love begins, listening to ourselves and then to our neighbors. I encourage each of you to listen to all the voices in the community as you, continue, as you consider similar matters of policy. Let's make sure that we're making choices with compassion, understanding, and a commitment to what's best for the children in our schools. Our students look to us to be helpers, to make sure they have a place where they can learn and grow without fear. I hope that we can work together to create an environment that is open, caring, and respectful for everyone. 
In that spirit, I wanted to mention how important the inclusive playground is for this community. Mr. Rogers also said, play is really the work of childhood. By funding an inclusive playground, we're giving every child the chance to do that important work side by side. We're showing them that our community is a place where everyone matters and where everyone has a friend. It's worth the investment. I've reached out to a couple uh, parents that have kids that are affected in the inclusive playground, and they really seem to think option three was the best. Uh, and they wanted me to mention that not transferring uh, a, children, a child in a wheelchair really keeps, keep, keeps their dignity. And please ask the parents and aides uh, when we're walking through this if uh, we're buying is going to make sense for them. And thank you for ma helping make us sure. Thank you for helping us make sure that every child feels important, safe, and can play. All right. Thank you, Mr. Fickus. Uh, Kim Klein, you are next, followed by Melissa Cook. Melissa. Good evening, board members. Several weeks ago, I wrote Dr. Nell concerned about multiple comments made by a board member on Facebook and as well as in public, denigrating immigrants in our community as well as within the state of Pennsylvania. My concern over these comments was that allowing comments like these from someone in a position of authority in our school district to go unchecked would permeate through the community and eventually end up becoming a problem in the school community and creating an environment of fear and bias where heat goes unchecked. Dr. Nell advised me to address these concerns to the board itself. I did so. And as of tonight, other than an acknowledgement of receipt from Mrs. Carter, I have heard from no one. No one. As I predicted an online post about wearing purple against bullying LGBTQ youth that was posted in the high school garnered dozens of comments from the community. Some were supportive, but many were hurtful and outright violent. In case you didn't read them, let me share some of their community comments, their language, not mine. Bring back bullying. Great LOL, we don't want a nation full of pussies. So disgusting. We need bullies to keep balance. What the F is with these schools? F, LGBT. Sick. Make bullying great again. I mean, if your kid bullies enough, if your kids bullied enough, it might turn them straight, which is what most normal parents would hope for. In a dog dog world, do we really want your kid to be a pussycat? Let them be bullied so they can grow up and hide behind a badge and a gun. The response from the school: We did what was legal re legally required by law, allowing the post. Where's the condemnation of violence? Where is the support for children who deserve their school board to stand up for their right not to be persecuted? If you can't, as school board directors, come out and say that all students deserve to go to a school where they feel safe and free from violence, what are you doing sitting up there? When you allow comments from one director to go unchecked, all comments, like these hurtful and violent comments from the community members, become okay too. I know we disagree on many topics, and there are some issues we may never see eye to eye on, but the safety of all children should be one that we all stand up for. And that means calling out mean, hateful rhetoric directly when it happens by those on the board as well as by the people in the community. What you don't understand is we're here for the children, all the children. And if you did that, what was best to protect the children, we would support you 100%. But when hateful comments permeate members from the board as well as the community, and you as a voting board do nothing, we will call you out. Because there's nothing more important than protecting the physical and mental well-being of all children in our schools. Thank you. OK. Uh Melissa Cook, you would be next, followed by Thea Hofstetter. Okay. Um, <clears throat> good evening, Mr. Linamuth and school board members. Um, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge every single teacher in this room and in our schools, because it truly takes a huge, huge heart to be a teacher this day and age. 
And I feel like we just need a little more empathy and uh, care when it comes to our teachers and staff in these schools. We never know what someone, even us adults, are going through. Um, so thank, thank you. Um, I would like to mirror what Dr. Nell had said earlier, and I just wanted um, to come up here and thank our whole community and our, our entire schools for their support for our PTOs and what we do for our schools. Um, we had amazing turnout for our annual fall, fall carnival fundraiser and uh, do this without our volunteers, without our families, without our community. Um, and we are just so grateful for that. Um, it just takes a true village of people and their time to make these things happen. And I just want to give a huge shout out again to um, when it comes to teachers and staff and uh, administrators, um, a huge shout out to Dr. Stetler, Mr. Parisi, Ms. Dobbins, Dr. Del Marcel, Mrs. Forgotch, and Mr. Kingsborough for being the highlights of our dunk tank. Um, so that was a huge uh, fun for the kids. Um, I also want to mention last Wednesday, we had a commemorative celebration for two buddy benches that were put in at Bear Creek. Um, an amazingly kind student's parent brought to our attention at one of our meetings last year that her daughter thought it would be a huge benefit for our school to have a buddy bench for students who could use a friend during recess. Common Sense and Bear Creek PTO partnered together with Mr. Vio and the community, and with the help from donating recyclables, were able to sponsor two benches. And uh, so we had a little celebration for that last week, and we would like to also thank Linda Shrum for attending. That would mean a lot, so thank you. And we're just very grateful for the things that we get to partner with, with when it comes to our schools. Um, and we hope that the students enjoy the buddy bench. Um, it was also exciting to hear the three options for the uh, playground, option three, and we really pray a whole bunch of us that um, those options get approved and it moves ahead so the appropriate timeline can be uh, successful. So um, I was going to talk a little bit, but obviously the time is um, dwindling down, but I just want to take a moment because it seems to be a highlight of tonight, unintended consequences. Sometimes when decisions and um, actions are made, there are unintended consequences that happen. And I just think it's something that you all need to really focus and breathe and take care of and think a little more when it comes to decisions. So thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Donna Coble would be next, uh, followed by Nick Peterson. Good evening, board. Uh, I don't have a lot to say other than I'm here. And I know you people up there, the board members, have a terrific job. I would not want to be in your shoes, but I'm here to support you. And at this point, I think you're all doing a fantastic job. And thank you for your service. Thank you. All right, we have a Nick Peterson. Okay, Nick is next, followed by David Koppel. Uh, everyone, uh, Nick Peterson, shout out to Mr. Safford, old history teacher. There's a lot of teachers here who had me. Um, I'm 30 now, so you guys are old. Uh, <laughs> uh, Superintendent, if that's true, you could have changed that. That's ice cold. That ain't cool. Miss uh, Linda Muth, I was going to do a Facebook Live video, but I figured I'd just come here and call you ignorant to your face for that uh, Facebook Live video. Man, that ain't cool. Keep those comments to yourself. There's nothing public about, uh, nothing private about Facebook. That's all public stuff. You're a public servant. You got voted for that. You're held to a higher standard. Act like it. Thank you.
Okay, we have David Koppel followed by Jason Dees. I want to ask the board to make sure that our district properly educates our students on the U.S. Constitution. This foundational document is the cornerstone of our country, but we live in a time when many adults do not know or understand it. For example, it has become popular for people to cite the First Amendment in such a way as to make obvious they don't know what it really says. The First Amendment states, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble petition the government for redress grievances. It is clear that the First Amendment protects the people from the government persecuting people for speaking out. It bans government censorship. Many putative adults, however, believe that the First Amendment states something like anyone can say whatever they want and no one ever needs to face any consequences for voicing their opinions, lies, or anything else no matter how garbage those statements may be. The First Amendment protects people from government censorship, but not from consequences. Since this confuses so many people, it is imperative that our students are taught the actual content of the Constitution and its amendments. Our children should be raised to know and appreciate the foundations of our country, rather than misuse it as a shield behind which to rationalize their personal, moral, and ethical failures. It's our responsibility to educate our children and raise them better than the adults who were failed by the education system and their parents. All right. We are with Jason Deeds is next, and if, if Thea Hofstetter is back, uh, she would follow. Thank you kindly. Dear board members, first tonight, I'd like to say thank you to the admin team. Recently, you took the social media account to show support for diversity and inclusion by uh, expressing the, and reaffirming the students' rights in the GSA to have their. Excuse uh, me, can we start the clock? No, oh, sure, thank you. Would you like me to start over? Just go. <clears throat> Thank you, admin, for your recent uh, social media posts that supported the continued diversity and inclusion of our students, their clubs, by reaffirming the GSA's rights to promote and run their events on campus. Thank you. Every child <clears throat> not only deserves but is guaranteed a safe learning environment. Yet recently, within our own community, many disparaging comments have been made towards LGBTQ immigrant populations. A board member's recent on September 18th is an example of that continued rhetoric that has continued to grow a hostile learning environment for <laughs> some populations of the student body. While board directors are allowed 100% of their opinion, there's a degree of free speech as a, as a uh, pavilion. I would caution everyone to research and reach out to the solicitor explaining the limitations of free speech placed on elected officials who are in positions of making policy. There are limitations when one begins to speak on subject matters for which they are elected to create policy. The ALCU, or ACLU has a great flow chart so you can understand what you have rights to speak about and what you do not. <clears throat> I also brought it with me in case you need a quick glance. I also reached out to the solicitor to do a quick education on the Hatch Act. We are coming up on elections and I found over 15 violations of the Hatch Act on different members' pages. As a reluctant as I am to quote uh, Ms. Lindermuth, I would like to say, we must be insistent, we must be consistent, but we must be polite. So I'm here again to insist that any type of rhetoric that targets a portion of our student populations that is disparaging recognizes discrimination. As an elected official who <laughs> uses their voice to continue this type of hostility towards marginalized groups is perpetuating a hostile learning environment. These actions violate the PHRC guidelines of discrimination and should be invested to the fullest by any board member. If this cannot be done by the board president because of conflict of interest, 
It should be done with PHRC directly. Thank you. Uh, the last but not least is Miss Hofstetter here. Has she arrived? No. Okay. I believe that concludes our public comment time. Uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, they will be taken under advisement. Okay, we have one action item tonight. That That's it. Uh, it is a small personnel report. So we will turn that over to uh, Dr. Annette. Certainly, thank you. Uh, I recommend approval of the attached personnel report rec uh, pending receipt of the necessary paperwork. All right, we have a motion to approve and a second. Are there any questions or comments concerning the personnel report? I guess I just had one question. This, this, uh, this warehouse position, uh, it says warehouse two full time. Is that, that's a labor? That's not, um, it's not an administrative position, correct? No, our warehouse is where we uh, store orders and supplies as they come into the district and then they're inventoried and then they're redistributed out to the district to wherever they belong. So it's someone who assists with that workflow of, of supplies coming in and then going back out to the schools or classrooms. So it's, it's not an administrative position, no. Okay, because I know that just recently within the last two months we had cut someone from the warehouse. So this is not related to that, it, or is it? No, not the same position. Okay. No. Thank you. Any, uh, any other questions or comments? Okay, hearing none, uh, we'll take our roll call vote on this item. Mrs. Maxwell? Mrs. Carter? Yes. Mr. Emery? Yes. Mr. Gillis? Yes. Mrs. Linduth? Yes. Mr. Reed? Yes. Mr. Riegelman? Yes. Mrs. Schramm? Yes. Mrs. Wilson? Yes. Mr. Lindemuth? Yes. That brings us to closing items. Uh, just for sake of transparency, we did have an executive session tonight at 5 p.m. It was uh, basically, we were looking at the property issue, the, the possible purchase of uh, real estate or property. Uh, actually, as it dealt Bainbridge, we discussed that tonight. So that was the reason for the session. Uh, as far as I know, there are no other executive sessions scheduled at this point in time. Um, so with that being said, uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion. We have a motion and a second to adjourn. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, we are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>